Thanks to NAPSI for sponsoring this conference. I'll be discussing the potential for high fever-like temperatures and gut acidity to boost honeybee resistance to a gut parasite. The parasites I've been studying, Crithidia and Lamaria, may not be the first things that come to mind when you think of honeybee ailments. In fact, the dominant trypanosomatid of honeybees worldwide, Lotmaria passim, was only named in 2014 by Ryan Schwartz, a postdoc right here at the Bee Research Lab. These parasites are in the trypanosomatid family. They are phylogenetic relatives of the insect vectored tropical diseases, leishmaniasis, African sleeping sickness, and Chagas disease. These parasites have also been found in over 80% of colonies in some national surveys, including in the US, and associated with colony collapse on three continents. Related parasites in bumblebees have a range of chronic effects, including slowed colony growth, impaired foraging efficiency, and reduced overwinter survival. So what can be done to mitigate infection? There are a few unique aspects of the honeybee's social lifestyle that could provide advantages against parasites. First, the large colonies of honeybees enable them to keep the colony at high temperatures, similar to those of warm-blooded mammals. This kind of temperature regulation is quite rare among the generally cold-blooded insects. And we can think of colony-level maintenance of high temperatures as a kind of social fever that prevents growth of opportunistic pathogens. Honeybees also have acidic guts as a result of fermentation of their fiber-rich diets by gut bacteria. These pickled intestines can likewise restrict the growth of pathogens. And my previous research showed that both high temperatures and acidity reduce growth of a related parasite from bumblebees, Rithidia bombi. Temperatures found in bumblebee queens, similar to those in honeybee colonies, inhibited growth of the bumblebee parasite, but actually accelerated growth of beneficial gut bacteria, meaning that a fever is more likely to kill off parasites than the non-pathogenic lactobacilli. The bumblebee parasite's growth was also inhibited by acidity levels within the range found in honeybee guts. This suggests that acids from gut bacteria could also inhibit parasites in honeybees. And infections showed an 80% reduction at 37 degrees Celsius, similar to the temperatures found in honeybee hives. These findings with parasites of bumblebees suggested that high temperatures and gut acidity could also protect against trypanosomatid infection in honeybees. I've started out by modeling the effects of temperature and pH on parasite growth and comparing honeybee parasites with related parasites from mosquitoes, which do not inhabit heated colonies and have alkaline rather than acidic guts, to test whether honeybee parasites display any special adaptations to the high temperatures and low pH levels that they encounter in bees. Here are the responses of growth to temperature in the honeybee parasites and the mosquito parasites. Prithidium mellifici, the parasite described in the 1960s, had the highest heat tolerance, higher than any insect-specific trypanosomatid studied to date, suggesting that selection for heat tolerance in the steamy bee colony has been a big factor in this parasite's evolution. Both bee parasites were more heat tolerant than the parasites of mosquitoes, again indicating that the high temperatures of the bee colony could provide protection against infection by non-specialist parasites. However, the emerging bee parasite, Lotmaria, was significantly less heat tolerant than Crithidium olivaceae, suffering a 50% reduction in growth rate over the temperature range found in brood-rearing honeybee colonies. This suggests that turning up the heat in the colony, either by changing the hive construction or breeding for bees that regulate a high temperature, would reduce infection in managed bees. Although speculative, the relatively low heat tolerance of the emerging Lotmaria 
raises questions about whether this parasite might have recently jumped from a different bee species with lower brood-rearing temperatures. The age tolerance also varied substantially between the bee and the mosquito parasites, reflecting differences between the acidic guts of bees, low pH, and the alkaline guts of mosquitoes, where gut pH can exceed 10 in larvae. The honeybee parasites grew at acidity levels a full two pH units lower than the mosquito parasites did, suggesting that the acidic guts of honeybees could limit the types of parasites that establish in the gut. The established parasite, Rithidium malefici, had a remarkably broad pH range, able to grow at any pH between three, that's Coca-Cola, and 10, ammonia. This could explain why it's been found in a broad range of bee hosts with presumably diverse gut chemistry. The emerging parasite, Lotmaria, appears well-suited to the acidic pH of the bee intestine, but growth was essentially limited to only acidic conditions. That may explain why this parasite has been found in acid-gutted apis bees almost exclusively. In the remainder of the project, I'm planning to compare the thermotolerance of bee gut parasites with that of poor gut bacteria, and then assess the inhibitory effects of gut bacteria and their metabolites on parasite growth. Finally, I'm looking to evaluate the relationship between temperature, gut chemistry, including acidity, and infection. I'm particularly interested in how the ratio of parasite to symbiont growth changes over the range of temperatures found in colonies which would influence resilience of the gut to invasion by opportunistic pathogens. These experiments could be informative for bee management, conservation, and ecology. For example, they could guide methods of colony construction and management to optimize temperature regulation, perhaps development of diets or probiotics that enhance thermogenesis and understanding of the seasons when the colonies need them most, and breeding for bees that keep the colony at parasite inhibiting temperatures. These experiments could also predict susceptibility to parasites in hosts that lack colony level thermoregulation and social transmission of gut bacteria. That includes many species of managed and wild solitary bees that are exposed to these parasites at flowers. More broadly, these experiments use bees as models to understand the value of endothermy, regulation of body temperature, as a regulator of the microbiome, the gut chemistry, and immunity to infection. And beyond the bee community, these experiments could enhance our understanding of parasite adaptations to heat and acidity that enable them to make the jump from insects to mammals. Recall that these parasites are closely related to the sandfly vector leishmania that infect one to two million humans each year. Heat and acidity are two major barriers to trypanosomatid infection in warm-blooded mammals, where body temperatures are much higher than those in most insects. And the intracellular parasite leishmania lives inside an acidic organelle of the white blood cells, where pH is almost exactly the same as in the honeybee rectum. Heat tolerance is also a feature that distinguishes the leishmania strains that cause unsightly but rarely fatal skin lesions from those that infect the warmer visceral organs, the liver and the spleen, causing over 90% mortality. The four degree difference in temperature between skin and visceral lesions is very close to the difference in heat tolerance between the mosquito parasites and the honeybee parasites. This suggests that bee parasites could serve as models for development of heat tolerance in generally insect-restricted parasites that nevertheless have potential to spill over into warm-blooded hosts. Other supposedly insect-restricted species can occasionally cause illness in humans, including a strain of Crithidia fasciculata that was recently implicated in an outbreak of visceral leishmaniasis-like illness in Brazil. And bee parasites may turn out to be more than mere models of parasite spillover and host shift. Rithidium malefici was recently found in blood samples from wild bats, lemurs, <clears throat> marmosets, coati, and other wild mammals near Rio de Janeiro. 
indicating that its adaptations to the high temperatures of honeybee colonies could allow its survival in warm-blooded mammals. My hope is that this research helps to illuminate the evolution of heat tolerance in trypanosomatids in ways that protect both beneficial insects and the warm-blooded humans and wildlife vulnerable to trypanosomatids. With that, I'd like to thank my colleagues, family, and sponsors, and you for your audience. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you.